Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast, where we empower you with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom. I'm Josh Metal, and I'm here today with my new friend, Todd Bollinger. Todd has worked in the financial service industry for 30 years. He's founded or co-founded 10 different companies focused on financial literacy, assets, and mortgage planning. Todd is also the author of Borrow Smart, Repay Smart, and crossing the balance sheet. He's a two-time Inc. 500 winner, a three-time KPMC Fast 50 winner, and was twice awarded the 40 Under 40 Award by the Triangle Business Journal. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Todd. How are you doing today, buddy? Doing great, Josh. Thanks for having me. Oh, my, my pleasure. And I know that our listeners are going to get an absolute ton out of this show. And, and we, we're kind of you know, doing this at an interesting time, right? We just got um, the, the fastest inflation reading or the highest inflation reading uh, in the last 30 years. Inflation now over 6%. And that just came out a couple of days ago. And I think both of us are inspired to talk about how inflation affects both sides of the balance sheet, both the assets and liabilities. And so this conversation could not have come at a better time. And I can't think of anybody I'd rather have this conversation with. So thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. It's good to be here. Let's do a little background. So you have an interesting and I think very diverse background. Um, would you kind of give us the background, how you got into financial services and, and, and why you chose that route? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I guess as a kid, for some reason, uh, I found money very fascinating. Uh, maybe because I uh, induced growing up, we didn't have a lot of it. We certainly weren't uh, uh, deprived, but we, we, you know, it was like it seemed mysterious to me in some way. Certain <laughs> people seemed to understand it, know a lot about it, and some didn't. And uh, I just decided that I wanted to learn about it. So as a kid, I, I, I even at a young age, I started reading and. I would, uh, I taught tennis at this local tennis club and I would ask, you know, entrepreneurs and people about uh, money. You know, it was kind of a weird thing. It was almost taboo in a way. It was like, you know, walking up and saying, hey, can we talk about money? And I'm like, what? You know, but I learned a ton and I found some people really understood it and some, some really had no clue uh, about what it really meant. And when I got out of college, I was like, you know, I've always been interested in this. Why not uh, pursue it as a career? So I got my securities license insurance license and real estate license with the idea that I wasn't sure which area I wanted to go into and uh, started exploring all of them. I started out then eventually became a financial planner, built a financial planning company. And after about four or five years of doing that, realized that uh, there was a bigger opportunity to help people from the liability side of the balance sheet because people were spending more money on uh, real estate and credit card debt and things than they were saving for yes. their future. Yes. So I, I literally changed the name of our company. We became a lender and we started applying all of the money, all of the stuff we'd learned as financial advisors to our lending practice to differentiate, you know, what we did because we could, you know, we used to say, you know, people are heating and cooling their houses with the windows wide open. And if you, you know, if that were true, when would you want to know about it? Right. If, if you didn't know they were open, you know, when would you want somebody to tell you? And so we really focused on helping them understand a lot of the um, sort of misunderstandings that consumers have. Uh, one of the things that uh, we realized very early is that problems compound just like interest. Mm. And if you don't know you've got a problem, those are the worst because they have an opportunity to compound for long, long periods of time. So we just loved that lending from sort of financial mindset. And while we learned and mastered lending, we were also always constantly learning, trying to understand this game of finance so we could help our, our consumers and had an opportunity to do that you know, for the last, uh, last 30 years. Well, I am impressed as I've learned more about you and you, know, you and I've had the opportunity to spend several hours together over, over Zoom and over the phone. And the more I learn about you, the more impressed I am of, of what you have been able to create and build and really just your mission to help people uh, quit compounding their, their problems, I guess, is the way, the way that you said that. And I, I'm, I'm really impressed with that. So I know this conversation is going to be really insightful. And because we have so much, uh, so many relevant topics, let's, let's jump in then with that backdrop that you just sure. left us. 
Let's talk a little bit about debt and leverage. And uh, I, I wondered if you distinguish between good debt and bad debt. I was talking to a, 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 a young millennial. Uh, actually, she might even be she might even be Gen Z. Anyways, one of our younger teammates, uh, just literally out of a couple years of college, and she said to me, "Is there a difference between good and bad debt?" So I thought that'd be a good place for us to start off. Man, that's it's it's a wonderful question. Uh, I would even <clears throat> I will preface preface that by saying, uh, "How do you define debt first, and then good debt or bad debt?" And the reason I say that is. If you have a million dollars cash, yeah, and you choose to borrow two hundred thousand, say to buy a house, are you in debt? Right, because you you, you can say I have a two hundred thousand dollar loan, but to me the definition of debt was borrowing money that exceeded my current liquid assets. So people that learn to create wealth learn ultimately, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this. What's the highest and best use of my my cash and my capital, yeah. where's it going to provide the highest return? Where is it going to be the most liquid? Uh, these are all kind of key considerations. And we had a lot of consumers over time that we had to say, look, you know, they had this issue with being in debt. And I was like, you're not in debt. You've got, you know, half a million dollars in your 401k and a half a million dollars in your retirement funds that you're saving for the future. You're borrowing $150,000, you know, where you could pay cash if you wanted to. So that's the first you know, kind of uh, question is people that understand money and money dynamics and compounding and time value and all those, those concepts, they understand that, that money wants to go where it can earn the highest return. And that's one of the things you have to help people understand is, is what is that highest return. But if you go beyond that, you think of debt, then is I'm borrowing money that I don't have for something I need now, then what's the difference between a good debt and a bad debt? And I simply define that is, is bad debt is usually an interest rate that's high, you know, higher than say what I can earn in the current market rates. And it's to purchase what is typically a depreciating asset, right? So that tends to be things that, you know, often credit cards, not credit cards used as a convenience, but credit cards used to, to, to finance, you know, purchases, uh, pay loans, personal loans, things like that. I typically think of that as sort of bad debt. I actually put auto debt as sort of neutral because we need a car. You know, walking to work is not a practical for most people. So, you know, if you have to borrow for an auto loan, it makes sense. Then you just want to make a good decision, like buy something that's two years uh, old because you've, you've sort of avoided that depreciation buy. And in many cases, I've recently sold a used car for more than I paid for it seven years ago. <laughs> Because you have markets where, you know, uh, things appreciate. But auto debt, I kind of think of as somewhat neutral. And then good debt, and there are really two, I think of what I'll call, I'll put it in the category of student loans, but things where in that case, you're investing in yourself, which you would hope is an appreciation asset. Right. And typically those loans are very low cost, you know, um, and can be deferred. And then uh, mortgage loans, because you're buying, again, an appreciating asset and you're buying um, uh, something that has a very low cost of debt itself. So I tend to think of, you know, anytime you reinvest in yourself, personal development, uh, whatnot, that's a, pr my, my sister's borrowing money right now to go get an MBA, but her employer's already told her, her income will go up by almost 30% when she completes the MBA, right? So she's investing in herself and she knows there's a great ROI there, but, I, but that, that's, you know, I, um, if that's helpful, but that's kind of the way I tend to think about it, because you really want to get that question of what is debt and what is it relative to out of the way before you really get into the good debt and, and, and bad debt, because that can vary. And, and, and as with most things, it depends on the person's situation. If you're having to fix your car to get to work, and the only way to do that is to put on a credit card, you may have to do that. But otherwise, you don't want to pull forward your future earning power by borrowing today, because I, you know, I was a simple guy and I used to, th I used to think of my, you know, this is really about me. It's not about bank having a credit card. It's I'm borrowing for my future self, you know, at 18%. And if I pull that buying power forward to buy it today, I've taken that buying power away from my future version of myself. Not only have I taken that money away, if I borrow a thousand on a credit card 
I got to pay the thousand back plus 18% interest. I'm taking from myself, just like when I'm saving money, I'm actually loaning money to myself, my future self, that money plus interest. So well, I always kind of look at it as that. an exchange. Yeah. Do I want to borrow from my future self or do I want to lend to my future self? Because either way, I earn, I earn or pay the interest. I'd rather loan to my future self with interest than borrow from my future self with interest, because at some point I'm going to be that future self and I'll be happy you know, if I'd gone the other way. Well, I like to challenge people that have the assumption that all debt is bad by saying, oh, okay, well, what about the people over at Apple? Do you think that those people are, are pretty smart people? And most people go, yeah, we think they're pretty smart people. And we go, okay, well, as of January of 2021, Apple has $112 billion in debt. Um, they call it bonds. Um, you know, they, they, they do a bond offering and the public market buys those bonds and Apple pays interest in it. And I can't, couldn't find it. I was trying to Google really quickly, but the last time I looked there, they had something like $200 million in cash or cash equivalents. You know, some of that's probably overseas that they don't want to bring back to the U S or whatever the reasons are, but you, you have to, you have to zoom out and say, what is wall street doing? What is the biggest companies in the world doing? Are they all zero debt? No, they are not zero debt. They are, you, they, are, an, they are analyzing how do we borrow low and invest high. And if I can borrow $112.4 billion at a low cost, and I can leverage that capital in my business and make a higher rate of return, then that is going to accelerate my ability to grow as a company and accelerate my rate of returns. So if, if it's good for Apple, if it's good for Wall Street, if it's good for those most successful companies on the planet, why wouldn't it be good for us on our personal finances? And I think yeah. that's what you were saying, Todd. Absolutely. You know, uh, I use a simple example. You know, what happened the first time someone taught you to play tic-tac-toe, Josh? <laughs> I can't remember to be honest, Todd. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? To win. <laughs> if, if, uh, yeah, if a big brother, or big sister, you know, drew that little grid out and said, "Hey, let's play tic tac toe," and they put in an X, you put in an O. Most people, what happens the first time they play? They lose, probably. They lose. They lose because they don't really understand the rules of the game. Once you understand the rules of the game, for example, in tic tac toe. There's two things that can happen. You concentrate and you'll never lose again, right? Because you can at least tie. And at times you can win because the other person loses their focus. But the option for losing, it kind of goes away. I think of money money like that, right? It's like if no one ever, yeah, if no one ever shows you the rules of the game, you're often losing more than you're winning. But once you get the rules kind of figured out, you're like, okay, I can at least cat. I can at least, you know, not make bad decisions. And at times I might make really good ones. And I think it was Buffett that said, you only need three or four good decisions in your lifetime to do really well financially, meaning mm -hmm. buying the Apple or <laughs> investing in Bitcoin in 2010 or whatever. You don't need a hundred of those. You just need a couple sort of good decisions over time. But to, to do that, you got to avoid the big losses that come with not understanding um, how to play the game. Companies, if you gave me $100, you had $100 cash in your pocket, and you gave it to me, and I gave you back 120 right now, you did that, and I get, what would you, what's your next question that you would probably ask me? You want another $100? Can we do it again? <laughs> yeah. Can we do that again? I love that game. And you said, yeah, but I need 1000 could you justify borrowing $1,000 from one of your friends to play that game? Heck yeah. Heck yeah, because I'm going to give you back 200 And that's the example when you're talking about companies is those companies, they realize I can borrow money at 1% or 2% and reinvest it in buying my own stock. Mm. And buying, the own, buying my stock in my company reduces the float and drives the price up. So one of the things we've seen in terms of fueling this market growth has been companies borrowing at incredibly low rates and buying their own stock back because it's like investing in yourself. Right. If I believe in my company, 
Apple believes in its products and its services, right? It's not giving all that money back to the investors. It's saying, we believe in our future. And yes, we'll borrow money. We don't need it 1% to buy our stock and, and to buy other companies and grow. And I think people can have that same mindset. I mean, if you're not reading, you're not learning all the time, right? You're, you're not reinvesting in yourself. You're not buying your own stock back in, in a way, right? Really well said, Todd. Wow, it's insightful. So I want to just net out this uh, a few things that you said. We talked a little bit about good debt or bad debt. And I think what I heard you say is, you know, if, if, if you borrow money and you can actually earn more money off of borrowing that money, that would fall into the definition of good, good, good debt. So that could be buying a house, a rental property, investing in a business, those are certainly, I think we would all agree, good debt. The bad debts are the uh, money that is borrowed. And I love how you said that. I'm borrowing it you know, really from my future self who is going to really want that money one day when I don't want to work uh, 40, 50 hours a week. But it's, it's borrowing money on an asset that is a depreciating asset. And, and maybe we should go there for just a second and, and talk about appreciating assets. You know, this is one of the things I learned from my grandparents that was probably one of the most useful things for me is that my grandma was so simple that she said, you know, if you just get in the habit of getting excited about buying appreciating assets versus depreciating assets, you really don't have to know too much more. It's not rocket science. And an appreciating asset is something that over time has shown its ability to go up in value. And a depreciating asset is something over time that has shown a, a tendency to go down in value. So, so Todd gave us a little bit of a dichotomy there because he said he recently sold a used car for more than he paid for it. But that's not the normal, the normal, right? And normally we do a, a five-year loan and it's worth 15, 20% of what it was when we paid yeah. for it. So, so cars exactly. are depreciating assets, land is appreciating assets. What else would you add to clarify that point, Todd? Yeah, so uh, you know, you go to the store and buy a sweater with your credit card. Uh, when you walk out of the store, that sweater is probably worth less uh, unless you return it immediately with a tag on it. But once you take the tag off, right, that sweater is worth less. Just try to go sell it on Poshmark yep. or, or online on eBay, right? Um, what compounds that is if I bought it on a credit card at 18%, I might be paying for that sweater, which means I'm actually increasing the cost of the sweater over time because I'm still paying interest on the sweater. It, the cost is going up as the value is going down. That's why the bad debt compounds in such a negative way. Um, I love cards. I, I put everything I have on a credit card and I pay it at the end of the month because it's wonderful con for convenience, uh, but it's not an antidote for people who don't have the ability to buy something today, right? And now, you know, investment stocks can go up, uh, uh, any type of, of thing that people will want in the future, durable types of things uh, traditionally go up in value. And most of our money is spent on depreciating assets. I mean, food important, but it's a depreciating asset. It actually spoils pretty quickly, right? <laughs> that's, that's true. Hopefully we're investing that food in our bodies that become the appreciating asset over time. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it. Well, I think yeah, this and, is... and, and go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you're, you're a Jedi at housing and, and housing is, is really an interesting thing because, you know, it, first it costs extra to live indoors. Would you agree? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, the alternative to that but is worth not, it. not very exciting. <laughs> yeah. So it's worth it. So then the next option you have is to rent or buy. Right. So in either case, you make a mortgage payment. If you rent, you're making the landlord's mortgage payment. If you buy, you're making your own mortgage payment. So you have to really, first off, living outdoors isn't tenable. That's just not something I want to do. So then the next question is, do I want to pay my landlord's mortgage payment or my own? I want to pay my own. Why? Because if I pay my landlord's mortgage payment, they're getting the appreciation on the property while yes. I'm servicing their debt. If I own the house, I'm servicing the debt, but I'm also benefiting in the appreciation, which historically has outpaced the cost of ownership. So if you just look at it from a standpoint of, of I'm going to live indoors, owning a home allows me to almost have a no cost 
to live indoors over time. But if I borrow 200,000 to buy a $300,000 house, and in 30 years, that house is worth a million dollars or $800,000, that appreciation has offset my payments over time. That's it's right. really kind of balance sheet neutral. But if I paid rent for 30 years on a, a rent equivalent for that house, there's no offset. That four or five, six hundred thousand I've paid is gone forever. I've had a material decrease in my wealth. So it's a really good example of just, again, buying an appreciating asset at least allows you to maintain wealth over time. But in many cases, if most of us have owned real estate for long periods of time, we've seen the values go up uh, exponentially more than what it's cost us to service that debt because we're, we're servicing that debt in today's dollars, which you know can be really beneficial reason to borrow. Yeah. And Todd, I'll, I'll just put a story to that really quickly. I've told this story before on the podcast, so I'll make it brief. But the first apartment building I ever bought with my, my mom as my partner was an eight unit par property right up by Capitol Hill in downtown Salt Lake City, just a beautiful piece of land. And, um, and, and we bought that building 20 years ago at $315,000. And the average rent in that building was about $325 a month, annualized a little less than $40,000 a year in annual rents. And I think it was actually more like 30, 32, 35,000 in annual rent, something like that. Fast forward 20 years later, the average rent on that property is about $1,450 to $1,500 a month. And the annual income uh, we just figured in the last year was about $143,000 in annual income. So the, uh, there's a lot of places we could go with that, but I, I want to keep this narrow. So that was a fantastic deal for me. It was a fantastic deal for my mother because we got to continue to raise those rents over 20 years, but the cost of our debt stayed the same. But it was a horrible deal for those tenants because those tenants who could have locked in the cost of their debt on that mortgage of a property for 30 years, essentially, as you said, Todd, you have a mortgage, whether you rent or if you buy. The difference is as you rent, you're paying your landlord's mortgage, number one. But the second difference is, Todd, that you're on an adjustable rate mortgage. When you're a, when you're a renter, you're, it's, like, it's like having a mortgage, but it's a one-year arm. And every year, it's gonna, it, you, know, you have the, the opportunity for it to go up. This year, 2021, um, the studies that I'm looking at says year to date rents are up, up over 13%. And by the end of the year, the forecast is we're going to have a 20% increase in rents. Imagine if I was a mortgage lender and I said, that's kind of ironic because I am a mortgage lender, but about it, <laughs> imagine if I said to you, Todd, I said, Hey, Todd, how, how do how, I have this great mortgage loan? You're going to love it. It's fixed for one year and it can go up 20% next year. What do you think? You want should we do that one? Are you good with that? No, I'm I'm not too interested in that one. Not too interested in that. So, anyways, no. um, over no, it, time, that's it, a perfect it's a perfect example because you're spot on. The house is going up in value, but I'm maintaining that cost of living in the home. Right? It's going to be fixed for thirty years. As a renter, I know that it's going to go up with inflation and in inflationary markets you're going to see that rent go up even faster. So you really are uh, turning over the, uh, the, your sort of future wealth to the whims of inflation, your landlords, um, and they can you know, decide to sell your house at any time, in which case you're having to move and that can be very disruptive. And there are a lot of other benefits, but I think financially locking in that cost over time and knowing that most of the time you're an appreciating asset is a pretty key part of, of understanding good debt. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, this is a perfect segue then because we've kind of already dipped our toe into the topic of the day, which is inflation, because we've talked about rent inflation over twenty years. Uh, so, so let's talk. Let's talk a little bit more about that because I I don't think people understand the tax uh, on your future wealth and buying power that inflation is. So, so yesterday the consumer price index, CPI, which measures inflation on the consumer level. Uh, it was hotter than was expected. It was up 6.2% year over year, which is the highest rate in 30 years. And I'm curious about how you think about inflation. And do you think of it as prices going up? Or do you think of it as the dollar's 
uh, buying power or value going down? How do you position that in your mind and think about it? Yeah, well, you know, in reality, it, it's it's both. The prices themselves are going up, but in that price going up, your buying power for your fixed dollars, your cash or whatever, is is being uh, depleted. And you know, we live in a progressive tax system, which means the more you make, the more you pay, right? Your brackets are, are tiered in a way that uh, if I make 100,000 a year, I'm in a 22% federal. If I make 400,000 a year, I might be in a, a 35% federal tax bracket. Inflation is one of those few taxes that is agnostic to your income and your financial situation. Uh, if you eat, you drive a car, any of these sort of things that are part of that CPI, you actually feel inflation. You may not understand it. I don't really understand gravity, but I feel it, right? I know that it's operating. <laughs> you know, I don't really understand electricity, but it's it's having an impact right now in this room. Um, inflation is like that to a lot of people. They don't really understand it, but boy, they feel it. And they go yeah. to spend their money. It's worth less. So it's really a silent tax. And it's very unfortunate because seniors and things like that who are no longer earning income, maybe they're sitting on a pile of cash. You know, you, you have, as you know, Ray Dalio talks about sort of this difference between, you know, wealth is buying power and financial wealth, right? And, you know, wealth is buying power is I have a million dollars, okay? If that will buy me a lot, there's a lot of buying power there. But if it's financial wealth, and a loaf of bread costs a million dollars tomorrow, I'm not really that wealthy, right? Because all I can buy with it is a loaf of bread. And, and we saw this in Brazil when January, uh, February, March, three months, you saw 71, 72, 80% inflation rates. So if you got up the next day and things cost 70% more than they did a month earlier, that's terrifying because you can't, you know, people, you're taking a wheelbarrow full of cash to go to the grocery store. And, and that's happened in, in many countries. And, and we've been blessed as, as a U.S. dollar sort of, uh, you know, the, the fiat currency of the world right now. We've been able to control that. But when you print as much money as we have, you start to have so much liquidity in the system that people can be really aggressive with their purchasing. And if they're willing to spend more for things, that drives the price up and that drives the price up for everybody. Right. Um, and then you have supply demand issues. But at the end of the day, inflation is really, really painful and it can be devastating financially if you don't have assets to inflate with it. You know, uh, if, you, if your assets you know, are inflating on a relative basis, like my house was worth 500, suddenly it's worth 700. You're like, oh, well, that's kind of nice. I like inflation. And my stocks were worth 500,000. Now they're worth 700,000. Oh, that feels pretty good. I mean, at least you have assets that are inflating against this goods and other stuff. But if you don't have those assets, you don't have a house, you don't have investments and stuff, and inflation's going up, it becomes really painful because you don't even have the feeling of being wealthier. Yes. So Todd, you nailed it. And I think this is, I think this is where we should, we should uh, go with this is that the people who are, are harmed the most by inflation, and you alluded to this, it is somebody on a fixed income where their income doesn't go up annually. Um, you know, the, the, in, the, in the workforce, we're seeing household incomes go up. And so things are costing more, uh, goods and services, food, they cost more. But I did get a 15% or a 10% raise this year. So if I look at it in relative terms, I'm making more, things cost more, it doesn't hurt that bad. But if I'm retired and I have a fixed pension or I have a fixed retirement that maybe goes up a little bit, but it doesn't go up at the, flate, at the same rate as inflation, um, some, some reports I've been reading around food is some food items are up 30%. Nobody's pension's going up 30% a year, but they all need to eat. So um, those, the person on a fixed income that doesn't have raises, that person gets hurt the most. And I'm, I want your feedback here. The second person who I think gets hurt the most is someone who thinks that the dollar is an asset. The dollar isn't an asset. It's currency. And as Todd said, it's a fiat currency. 
that that it means that it's not backed by anything tangible. It's only backed by a you know I promise uh, Boy Scouts honor, um, and so as that um, cash that somebody has has less value then that person is getting damaged. On the other side, if somebody were to take that currency, that cash, and then put it into an asset that is keeping up with inflation or outpacing inflation, i.e. real estate, gold over time, Bitcoin, businesses that tend to do well and continue to grow over long periods of time, stocks, then, then yes, the cost and goods of services go up, but so are my assets. So I'm at least keeping pace. Anything else you'd add to that? No, I, 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 I think you really nailed it there. It's just understanding that dynamic and being, I mean, being aware that 15% of the entire money supply that exists, that's ever existed has been printed this year in 2021. And over 50% of all money in existence has been printed since the financial crisis in 2008. So, you know, again, if, if you understand that, your dollar that you had in January is probably worth around 85%. That's where when you're thinking about buying power, you still have buying power, but it'll buy you 85% of what it would have bought you in January. And just being aware that, okay, I've got to have that, that thing called cash, you know, earning. I mean, technically you think the market's done well this year. The stock market's up 24, 28%. But if, but if you've printed that much money and inflation is 15%, it's always relative. My real gain is that difference between how much my assets have appreciated and my buying power. And that's the thing like people don't understand when they get a cost of a living adjustment of 3% on their paycheck, they think, oh, I got another raise. You got a raise in financial fiat currency, but your buying power is the same. That's There's right. no increase in buying power this year because if inflation is 3%, and your paycheck went up three percent. You're just you're just pushing. So over time, people are like, man, I'm making one hundred fifty thousand dollars now. And, and years ago, I was making hundred, but I don't feel wealthier. And it's because it still takes one hundred fifty thousand to buy today what it took you one hundred thousand to buy then. And that's why that's one of those things that people don't understand. Like you know the gravity comment. I know I feel it, but I don't really understand why I feel like I'm doing so much better, but I'm really not. And that's that's the the, the sort of the silent erosion of of inflation on your buying power. That's exactly right. Really well said. You know, when Todd talks about 15% of the world's money being created in one year, it, uh, the other way that to look at that is, look, the, the, the piece of pie, the wealth is only so big. Uh, and if we decide to cut that piece of pie instead of into eight pieces, into 10 pieces, oh, no, great. Now we have 10 pieces of pie. Yeah, but the pie is still the same diameter. There's still the same amount of value in that pie. It's just that I cut it into smaller pieces, but, but, but now we feel like there's more pieces, pieces of pie. So we need to be aware um, in these inflationary times who, who, that, that wealth is a uh, tax and an eroder of, of your actual, inflation is an eroder of, uh, er, er, erodes your actual wealth. And if you're not positioned in a place where you can increase your income with inflation and your assets are not in a basket of goods or a basket of investments that keep up with inflation, you're going to get behind. And that's, that's, that's really you know, what I wanted to, to point out there. I think we did a good job. Let's talk about the other side of the balance sheet, because we've talked about who inflation hurts. Uh, if they have their money in cash or if they have inflation um, assets that do well inflation. But let's talk about the borrower. Let's talk about the person that has debts and how does inflation, how does an environment that has higher inflation impact the borrower? Yeah, again, it's another one of those things that unless you played tic-tac-toe, you want to understand this very critical kind of dynamic. And that is, Inflation decreases current purchasing power, but it also decreases the cost of borrowing. So if I owe someone $100,000 and inflation is, is, say, like you said, 5% or 6%, let's just use five. 
at the end of the year, if I were to write a check to pay off that debt, in today's dollars, I only have to pay $95,000 worth of buying power because inflation has devalued that debt. So when you, I remember the first house that my parents bought and 20 years later, you know, their $76,000 mortgage was like, you know, $35,000. At that time, a car was $1,000. And you think to yourself, wow, that's kind of, you know, uh, bizarre, right? But it's because back then you could buy for $76,000 or $86,000 a house and that debt was being devalued to where today it feels like it's almost nothing on a relative basis. So uh, this is an important thing to understand that in inflationary environments, and the U.S. is always in an inflationary environment, for the most part, if you look historically, the Fed's mandate is to average 2% inflation. They tell you what's their, what are they, what are they trying to do? They're trying to maintain 2% inflation. You have to ask yourself, why? Why would they want to maintain inflation, right? Well, one, it keeps you spending money because you know that your value of your money is going to be down. And I have two choices. I got to spend it or I need to invest it. If I invest it, the markets go up, right? And if I spend it, it stimulates the economy. So it's win-win. They can't afford deflation, which means that my money will be worth more in the future because then I'll just hold on to it. And then the economy goes to heck and the markets go to heck. So they're engineering inflation for a reason. And the other big reason is all the debt and how they're creating money. They're creating money through you know, the Fed and the Treasury. They print money and they create an IOU to themselves in the form of debt. So you end up with trillions of dollars of debt. Well, the longer I wait to repay that, the less it will actually cost me because I'm going to devalue that future debt with inflation. Right. So, you know, you always have to ask yourself, you know, is a million dollars in retirement a million dollars for you in 20 years or 30 years? The answer is no, it won't spend like a million dollars today. But if I borrow a million dollars, paying it off in 30 won't cost me a million dollars easy either. It'll cost me on a relative basis, you know, a lot less at 3% a year for 30 years. That's 90%. So I used to say, look, if you could borrow for 30 years, would you want to borrow for 30 years and pay it off quickly or borrow for 30 years and pay it off slowly? The, the perfect situation would be to borrow on a 30-year note and make the full payment on the 30th year. Right. A million dollars would feel like 300000 Well, if that's true, then why would you take out a mortgage and pay it off as fast as you can? That's it. You know, I mean, it's, it's one, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's binary. It's one or the other. Okay. You tell me I could pay off my entire mortgage in 30 years with one check. I would wait. Yeah. Because that 300,000 just borrowed will feel like nothing in 30 years. And, and, okay. and why does it feel like nothing in the, the, let me just make this little asterisk here, this little exclamation point. The reason it feels like nothing is because your income, if you're not retired and you're not on a fixed income, because your income will have kept up with inflation, which is in most instances and true, unless we get into hyperinflation. But, but so far, we're seeing household incomes going up. <clears throat> and in 30 years, you're going to be making a ton more money. But, but the debt is the same. You still owe the same number of dollars, but now you're earning a lot more dollars. So take that idea from your you know, personal and then apply it to my story about the rental property. When I bought the rental property, it, it, it was $315,000 worth of debt that we took on relative to thirty-five dollars or $40,000 worth of income. That felt like a lot of debt relative to that income. Fast forward 20 years, Todd, I have $145,000 worth of income. And of course, I'd paid down the mortgage. You know, Let's just say the mortgage at that point was $200,000. Now, how does that debt feel relative to the income? It's only one year approximately, you know, or a year and a quarter worth of income to totally pay off that debt. So we want to stretch out that debt if it's fixed and if it's invested in an asset that's going to continue to go up. We want to stretch it out for as long as possible so that when we pay it off, we pay it with future dollars where we're going to be earning higher dollar amounts. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll tie this back into our, our, our good debt conversation and why I think uh, student loans are, are, are borrowing if you had to, to borrow to invest in yourself is a good investment. 
Yes. You know, people that go to college, for example, make over a million dollars more over their lifetimes than someone who doesn't. That's an investment, even if you have to borrow to do it. But if you're an employee or an entrepreneur, either way, and your income is only going up relative to inflation, you're not increasing your buying power. So investing in yourself is one of the best ways to outpace inflation, meaning you're, you, you know, I can get a raise or I can move up within my company because I'm more effective. I'm a, I'm a better worker, whatever. You've got to do that because if you're waiting for the company to give you a 3% raise each year, you're just, you're, you're buying power staying the same. You've got to actually move up the ladder, so to speak, within the game of work. If you're self-employed or an entrepreneur, you've got to grow the business because then you have control over building your income relative to inflation, which is creating real wealth and buying power and allowing you to invest in assets that are inflating. And that's why, again, everything compounds. Yes. You know, if I make more money and I can invest more and I invest more and those investments go up faster and the debt's going down as I'm investing and the real estate's going up as I'm paying down the debt, things are compounding one way. The opposite way is the debt spiral. I, I'm not making enough. I have more month than money you know, on a regular rolling basis, which is a disaster. And I'm having to then pull forward from my future self and then pay interest on that, I go the other direction and everything compounds the wrong way. So you got to really understand the basics. Todd just taught you the tic-tac-toe of money. That was it. If you didn't get that, rewind and listen to the last 60 seconds. That is the, the fundamental tic-tac-toe of money right there. Todd, um, I want to just put one more exclamation point on this. I want to share a slide with you that I um, presented on the other day with a realtor buddy of mine. And I, I know that some people are going to be on a podcast, so I'm going to talk through this really quickly. W what this uh, slide shows is that the median home in 2006 cost $300,000. The rate of the average rate of interest was 6% in 2006. And the monthly payment, principal and interest only, was about $1,800. And I believe that I, when I ran these numbers, I based that off a 20% down payment. Fast forward to 2021, the average home price is $423,000. So home prices have gone up on average 41% since 2006, but the rate of interest is 3% on average, not 6%. So it's come down 50%. So the monthly payment, and this might blow some people away, but the principal and interest monthly payment, assuming a 20% down payment, is $1,783. Virtually the same payment that it was in 2006. But here's where it gets interesting, Todd. Household income is up 55% since 2006. So the average household income in 2006 was $7,000 per month. The average household income in 2021 is $10,850 per month. So if we look at this in terms of a home expense ratio, in 2006, my $1,800 payment was 26% of my $7,000 household income. In 2021, my $1,783 payment on my mortgage is only 16% of my $10,850 household income. So, so what I, the point I'm trying to make is if someone took out a mortgage in 2006, that $1,800 payment with 26% of their income going to pay that, it felt pretty substantial at the time. But fast forward 15 years, and now that $1,800 payment is only eating up 16% of my income. So the cost of the debt on a fixed rate mortgage stays the same, but your income goes up. And that's what Todd was saying. Over time, that debt starts to feel less and less significant due to inflation. Similar to my story, where a $315,000 debt on an apartment building with $35,000 a year in income seemed gigantuan. 20 years later, with $145,000 in income and the same payment each month, it felt like nothing. It was just a very minute portion of the income for the property. So um, what would you add to that, Todd? I know we only have a minute or two left, but um, any comments yeah, on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we've talked a lot about inflation, but one of the key drivers of inflation is interest rates. And again, the, the beauty of being a homeowner is that ability to lock in that new low interest rate over a long period of time 
the renter is subject to the whims of inflation in a way that they can't they can't collar and ratchet down. You know, for example, that cost thing. If they're at six and they're renting and it goes to three, the landlord will refinance and make a bigger spread on their gain. But the renter loses that. The homeowner can go from six to three. That's right. Lock in that lower rate for three years. And, and as rates go back up over time, they're able to continue to benefit from that over an extended period of time. But the same dynamic you just showed is explaining why the companies are borrowing at these low interest rates and why the stock market hits all time highs week after week, because the same thing is happening. They can borrow money inexpensively and, by, and the consumers can borrow cheaply and in borrowing cheaply, they can spend more on a discretionary basis, right? Because servicing that mortgage costs them less. That's right. Borrowing and buying that, that car. We just got a car loan. It was 0% interest for five years. I mean, I'm making a principal only payment. Inflation will devalue those payments. I would have gone 10 years if I could, right? Not because I can't pay for the car, because time value of money dynamics, I want that loan to be 0% and I want to pay it for as long as I can because it's going to cost me less and less over time. And these are games. You know, Buffett famously was asked if he'd ever gotten a mortgage. He said, I still had, it was like a $410,000 mortgage on his house and wherever he lived uh, out West. Omaha, and Nebraska. And was like, that's yeah, Nebraska. And it was like, they, and people were like, that's ridiculous. He goes, no, it's the principal. You know, I, it's just the money's so cheap. You know, I can't earn that somewhere else. You know, I can earn more somewhere else. I'm sorry. So it's just, yes. again, you understand these principles, even if, if you realize what got him there is he understood the principles and he stuck to it over time. I think that is a perfect way to end this podcast. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Buffett understood that paying back a debt in 2020 was going to be, the debt itself was going to be less valuable than paying it back in 1990. And so even though he had billions and you know billions and hundreds of billions at Berkshire Hathaway, he said, the principle is, why would I pay back a debt in today's dollars when I can pay it back in future dollars? And that's, a, that's just a beautiful way to end. Todd, I feel like we could go another three hours. And I know that this was just a really valuable interview. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing so generously. If people want to find your books, or more about the educational services that you offer, where can they find you? Yes, so we have uh, Mars Park University is, is, is sort of where we work with professionals to, to teach a lot of this stuff. So you can go there and, and learn more and, and access the uh, book if you wanna learn a little bit more about, uh, again, borrowing smart and how to repay uh, smart over time. And again, I'll just point out, it's not that you're not repaying, you're going to repay the debt, you just want to repay it the most efficient way possible. And that for many times, and there are times in the future where if, if rates are 10% and you're borrowing at 10 and the current market's returning five, I would say pay that debt off as fast as you can. I repay Absolutely. smart. But if the cost of borrowing is three and the market's returning eight, 10, 12% annually and dividends are six to 8%, that's a time to understand that I'm going to repay in the future. I'm going to pay off that debt in the most efficient way possible. It's not avoiding the debt or ignoring it. It's just simply saying, I'm going to look at the way and the strategy and do this in the most efficient way that creates wealth for me and my family. Buddy, thank you for teaching us the uh, tic-tac-toe of money and credit. I really appreciate you. Um, and I would love to have you back on a future episode. Thank you so much, Todd. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for listening to the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcast and Spotify to be notified of all future episodes and follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. If you'd like to learn more about Neo Home Loans and how we empower home buyers with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom, visit neohomeloans.com.